Welcome to UHD's Building a Movement, the Intersection of Social Work, Education, and Criminal Justice. Tonight, we will introduce you to the superheroes in the world, in our communities and in our schools. We will be discussing careers in social work, education, and criminal justice, the professionals that heal, inspire, and protect. I'm going to share with you a little story, and I, I'm going to show my age a little bit. I don't know how many people in the audience remember Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Oh, I'm, I'm feeling good here. So Mr. Rogers had one amazing quote about his mother, and here's what Fred Rogers said. He said, when I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news, and my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. This could not be truer than the professions of social work, criminal justice, and education. Tonight, we would not be here if it was not for Mr. Villano and the Center for Public Service and Community Research. The Vital Voices series, if you're not familiar with them, check them out online. They have wonderful presentations throughout the year. This is also brought to you with the Gator Advisory Board. The UHD College of Public Service Gator Advisory Board is made up of students who represent disciplines offered at the college, social work, criminal justice, and urban education. Our job is to represent our discipline, discuss issues with fellow students, and engage leadership for awareness and also for social events. These are the, my fellow Gator Advisory Board members here. <laughs> A little bit of housekeeping tonight, we're going to have different members of the Gator Advisory Board asking questions of our speakers. If you are in the audience and you have a question, Mr. Volano, who, who just stepped out, <laughs> Mr. Volano has pens and note cards for you. Jot down the question and make sure that you also write who you are addressing. And then we're going to be answering those questions. If you are watching online, just comment on the thread. Tonight, you are blessed with some ex exceptional speakers. First is Senior Officer Jo Jones. She has served 16 years with the Houston Police Department. In 2014, Senior Poli Police Officer Jones was assigned to HPD's Recruiting Division. During her tenure in Houston Police Department Recruiting Division, she recruited thousands of potential applicants from around the country. Senior Police Officer Jones became a member of HPD's Office of Community Affairs as the LGBTQIA liaison in 2020. And this is a quote from Officer Jones. It's my job to make sure my community is heard by HPD, and likewise to make sure the community understands the concerns of HPD. She feels that it is her duty to go above and beyond to ensure that the community is aware and understands that the police are here to help through good times and bad. Next up is Bernadette Booker. Having settled into a career in education through happenstance, Bernadette began doing <clears throat> the work she loves 15 years ago, quickly realizing it was her calling she never looked back. She knew almost immediately that she would work in literary spaces, but she thought it would be as an editor or a publisher. Not once did she consider education until the idea was suggested to her by a very close friend. Her career began as a kindergarten teacher in Austin, Texas, and she has been fortunate throughout her career to assist students from pre-K all the way through eighth grade in the realms of reading and literacy. As a literacy expert, she's been blessed with opportunities to leverage her skills both domestically and abroad, having spent three years teaching English overseas in Abu Dhabi before returning home initially as a district literacy specialist at Galena Park Middle School. She has since spread her wings and operated in several different capacities within education, parlaying her years of skills as a classroom teacher into positions such as campus coach, district literacy specialist, cohort leader for TEA. She is currently works in curriculum and instruction for Pasadena ISD. And last but not least is Linda Marie Olson. Linda Marie Olson is a therapist at Child Advocates of Fort Bend and an adjunct professor at UH Central. Linda Marie received her BSW at the University of South Carolina in 2017 with a leadership distinction in diversity and social advocacy and received her master's degree from the University of Houston in 2018 with a clinical specialization. Linda Marie has clinical experience working with at-risk children and adolescents in both the child welfare system and juvenile justice systems. 
Linda Marie is a National Institute of Justice Graduate Research Fellow and also a recipient of the Phi Kappa Phi Dissertation Fellowship. Linda Marie has presented her research at national and international conferences and has helped write multiple state, federal, and international grants regarding mental health, child welfare, and juvenile diversion programs. I'm also excited to share with you that just recently, Linda Marie obtained her PhD at UH Graduate College of Social Work. So let us get started with the questions. They are an unbelievably talented group of speakers and I cannot wait for y'all to hear from them. So tonight, Brandon is gonna be asking questions of Ms. Booker. Caesar and Jasmine will be asking questions of Joe Jones and I will be asking the questions for Linda Marie Olson. So first we're gonna start out with a question for all three of you. And we can just start with Linda Marie and just go down the row. And the question is, tell us about your journey to the career that you have and what drew you to the field. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, awesome. So I always knew that I wanted to be in some sort of helping profession. Um, but growing up, I kind of always thought that I would work with kids with developmental disabilities. So I spent a lot of time in high school volunteering with different respite programs. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, so different camps across the state that were working with that population and ended up going into social work then in college. And it wasn't until my first field placement at a child advocacy center that my thoughts kind of started to change a little bit and shift. Um, and then my second placement was at a lockdown residential treatment facility. Um, and I was working with adolescent boys in Memphis. And I just have a very clear moment of speaking to one of my clients and hearing the childhood trauma that he experienced. And it was just like something clicked in my brain of like these kids did not just get here for no reason, right? Many of them have experienced an extensive history of trauma at the hands of either parents or caregivers or other people in their life. And of course, they're going to act out and internalize and externalizing those behaviors in different ways. Um, and so I came back to my bachelor's program and focused primarily on trauma. Um, and so all of my research is in the trauma field as well, and specifically looking at neuroscience in how trauma impacts the brain of juvenile offenders um, and different interventions that we can use within those populations to hopefully intervene um, and cause some more sustaining effects than what we're seeing currently. Very nice. <clears throat> well, my story is a bit different. Um, you guys heard in my bio, it was never in my plan to be in education. Um, it, that, it was never my driving force. It was never what I wanted to do. I've always been a lover of um, literature. Um, so initially my goal was to go into editing or publishing, um, but out of college I was very frustrated. I started my first master's program, um, was not doing anything that aligned with my degree, and a friend made a suggestion. She said, you know, you've always worked with kids, you love working with the youth, why don't you teach until you can parlay that into a position that you really want to do? Um, the first year I was hired, I was hired as a kindergarten teacher, and I never looked back. Literally fell in love with what I was doing. Um, fell in love with it, um, developed a passion for it, or unveiled my passion for it, rather, um, and realized in a very, very short amount of time that I was doing very, very important work. Um, and once I realized that, I never wanted to do anything else. I never wanted to do anything else. So, so you know, some people are called I line to the the school of Tupac, where he says, you know, he, he didn't choose Thug Life, Thug Life chose him. I tell people I did not choose education, education chose me. I fell into it by happenstance, but I feel like I am where I'm supposed to be. Um, I would not want to be anywhere else doing anything else. Um, and I'm glad they found me. That's awesome. Um, thank y'all for allowing me to be here today, um, tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, talk to people about policing. So I look forward to the conversations that we're going to have. Again, my name is Joe Jones. I'm a Houston Police Department Community Affairs, Office of Community Affairs. And when I think about um, my journey thus far to getting me 16 years on the police department, I always knew I wanted to be a police officer. It's just something, you know, as you heard in my bio, I've worked in recruiting and that's something that you hear a lot. You just know, you know that it's in you, you know? And so I always knew I wanted to be a police officer. So 
I graduated from high school and I was going to join the military. I was going to be a military police officer. Didn't have anybody else in the family military, nobody in the family police, but I knew that this is what I was going to be. Um, I, I went to Blend Junior College and I played basketball at Blend Junior College and I'm getting ready to go off to military. I don't really know how I was going to make that happen. Didn't have a recruiter, didn't have anything, but that's where Josephine Jones was going to go. Um, so when I graduated from, um, I came down here to Houston from the small town of Belleville, Texas, Brenham, Brenham, Texas, played and blend college basketball. My sister and I, she's a, also a police officer for 22 years, got down here to Houston and realized, okay, I don't know anybody to talk to about joining the military. And I had a friend say, uh-uh, you don't want to do that. Why don't you go get an education? I came over to University of Houston downtown and I graduated from this um, university and I loved every moment of it. And so now I got a degree in criminal justice. What am I going to do with this? So I went and joined the YMCA. I became a director at the YMCA. <laughs> <laughs> the YMCA. I was the director. So I got paid to play with children and, and uh, you know, talk to families about community stuff and just really love the engagement and the opportunity that the YMCA afforded me as a director. I had a chance to go to um, Vietnam and help build houses. And so all the phenomenal experiences that I had in that career. I absolutely loved it. I did it for seven years. So one day I'm sitting at the YMCA day camp in Katy. It was formerly the Kenley YMCA. Now it's the Katy family YMCA. And I was sitting there. My sister said, you know, every dollar, every minute you work past 40 hours, you get paid for it, right? I'm like, mm. I always wanted to be a police officer. She's, she's a police officer. She's telling me like, hey, your salary, but you could be getting paid for all these extra, extra, extra hours you're putting in at the YMCA. And so I'm very fortunate to say that I chose to go ahead and follow my dream of being a police officer. And definitely when I say I would never look back, I've had a, a wonderful time serving as a police officer. Uh, patrol, I love patrol. I love patrol because it's just what it is. You're out there, boots on the ground, and you're relating and you're, you're working with people, people that need your help. And I loved it, loved it, loved it. And so then I did seven years of being a recruiter. They actually gave me a Houston police credit card to travel all over the U.S. to go and tell people about how great this career is. I love it. So I, it was awesome. I got paid to tell people, you know, about the, the goodness of the Houston Police Department. And so I absolutely loved it. So here's the catch. So that was seven years in recruiting. And when I say I loved it, I mean, I would sit down at my computer and say, okay, where do you want to go and who can you bring to this city? Because we want diversity, right? Um, I remember one day I was in Florida. I'm the LGBTQIA plus liaison, okay? Before I was the liaison, my sister was the liaison before me. She was the uh, LGBTQIA liaison. My sister's an ally. She's an ally. Well, she was getting ready to move to a different division and wanted to see, you know, wanted to basically pass the job that she's done as a liaison to someone that, you know, would continue the journey of making sure that we have, you know, um, a voice, make sure our community has a voice. And so she called me and she was like, hey, what do you think about being the liaison, you know, for the LGBT community? I'm like, hell no. <laughs> like, uh, excuse me, but I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Like, this is, this is fun. Like, I get points, traveling points or whatever. Um, so I was like, no, nah, I'm not interested, but I thought about it and, and I knew that it was something that would cause me to, um, step outside my comfort zone, you know, cause being a, uh, a lesbian woman on the police department was so it's something that I know I am, but it's nothing I ever really ever stood up and said that I am. And so being in this role, I have to make sure that I'm living my truth. Right. And so I absolutely love the challenge and it's been about three years in and, and I don't, I wouldn't trade anything for the world. I love it. So. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Brandon. Like, um, thank you so much, guys, for sharing your journey into your careers. Our first question will be for Miss Bernadette Booker. Um, how would you define making a difference in teaching, um, and what difference is your own goal? Mm, um, in the teaching profession. Being purpose-driven is extremely important. You have to have a why. Um, and you have to closely align how you operate in your practices with that why. That's not to say that your why is going to be static. 
It could very well change depending on the season that you're in in your profession, but you have to have a reason for doing what you're doing. And I always tell whether it's a mentee, whether it's a, a former a peer educator, I always tell them that when you are thinking about your why, it should be student centered. I always ask adults when it comes to education to remove adult ego, because when you operate in adult ego, you're operating outside your purpose as it relates to education, because it's not about you, mic drop, right? Um, my why has changed over the years. The last couple of years has been pretty consistent. Um, my why has been ensuring that we are doing the best that we can to assure that we create functioning literate adults. Um, something that's not talked about often, especially in the US, is our literacy crisis. We have a literacy crisis in our nation. 21% um, of American adults are illiterate which doesn't seem like a big number, but when you quantify it, that's about 43 million people, fully illiterate adults. Um, of the 79% that are literate, 54% are only literate up to a sixth grade level. In order to be a functioning adult in this country, read newspapers, read bus schedules, read magazines, fill out Medicaid paperwork, fill out insurance paperwork. You have to read at what's known as the 14th level. That's about somebody who's halfway through college. And about 70% of us cannot do that. And that is a direct problem that has to be addressed in our nation's school systems because that's where little people and big people are taught to read. So here in the last couple of years, that has been my why. And until I spiral and cycle out of this, until I no longer do this, that will more than likely be my why. That will be my difference um, because it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. We are a fully functioning operating nation and there should be no reason that there is a crisis around literacy in our country. None. So. Hello everyone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for. So, uh, hello everyone, I'm, my name is Cesar Escalante. I'm a grad student for criminal justice here in uh, UHD. And I'm also a police officer. So I know uh, Officer Jones since we were recruiting people together for a little bit. So uh, I know her journey and she's, she's great at it. So I'm, I'm really glad that she's here with us. So uh, I got a question for, for you, uh, okay. Officer Jones. So uh, uh, how is law enforcement, especially your department, uh, is adapting or changing based on social changes? So how is it adapting? In order to, in order to serve, I can't be a police officer without community, right? So I work in the Office of Community Affairs, but before that, and it's always been about the community. So you have to be able to, we know as a police department that we have to gain the trust of the community. Um, I've sat around enough meetings to know that if you don't have the community's trust, it's actually kind of difficult for you to be able to protect them, okay? Because I'm not calling the police. So um, we, we, we try and we have to break that, you know, and we break that by building trust. Um, since this, the social changes, you know, we have to be aware of what's going on. And people want to be, people want transparency from the police. That's just the bottom line, whether we like it or not, because we're like, we're the police, and, and you're gonna get information based on how we're gonna feed it to you. But that is not changing with societal you know, um, demands. So the chief of police, our, our chief Troy Finner, he's awesome. Um, we have, just like a lot of other metropolitan cities, we're starting to you know, be more transparent in how we put information out to the community. I don't know if y'all follow us on Twitter or Houston Police Department Facebook page or uh, Instagram, it tells you like HPD, we're here. This is what's going on. So if you're, you know, wanting to know what's going on in the city, we always tell you like where we are with the critical incidents. If there's a critical incident, and what I mean by critical incident, yeah, where there's an officer involved shooting, you know, of something that of that nature, um, the transparency that we are presenting, that we have been presenting lately, you know, changing with society, is um, releasing that information within 30 days. So some of it gets released before 30 days, but we release our body-worn cameras 
you know, and I think it's a very um, timely manner because what happens when we give people a chance to just sit in their thoughts about what happened? You know, it's like we can help keep our community calm and help keep our community working with us by showing something like that and being more transparent. So if you haven't seen any of our critical incidents, they are on YouTube, HPD YouTube. You can definitely go and find those. Um, I also believe that, you know, as far as um, social changes, we, we have, um, we're being more inclusive, just trying to be more inclusive because people want to know that they belong. So we want our department to look like our community. Um, and so we make sure that when we're recruiting, we make it that we can recruit from all fruit. You know, we want to make sure that I'll just speak for myself. When I was in recruiting, I felt like when you came and sat in front of me and, and you're a African-American, you had bad credit. So you're not going to be able to be a police officer because your credit, you got something on your credit, you got a, a, a medical issue or whatever. We, we didn't hire people based on um, credit. If you had credit issues, it was, I would look, see, okay, first thing I want is your credit report. Because if you have, if you have um, credit issues, you couldn't be a police officer. But now we have changed to, to kind of work with everybody, you know, because things happen, right? Life happens. And so we've gotten rid of some of those requirements. If you go to our, our website, hpdcareer.com, you'll see some of the changes that we've made. Um, and I can kind of just reference those two things. I don't want to take up all the time, but we really concentrate on understanding that trust. And the way you build trust is by showing up. The way you build trust is, is um, under promising, but over delivering. And so um, I feel like that's how we've changed. Thank you so much, Officer Jones. <laughs> Dr. Olson, so we would like to ask you about a day in the life. So explain to us what a typical day is like providing therapy at Child Advocates of Fort Bend. Uh, so at Child Advocates of Fort Bend, we have a CASA side and then the Children's Advocacy Center side. So I'm in the Children's Advocacy Center, and so we have multiple departments, um, but Basically, our forensic interviewing team works with the Department of Family and Protective Services and law enforcement. And so if there are any suspected cases of abuse, whether physical, sexual, medical, emotional, or neglect, and those reports will come in and we kind of serve as the middlemen. So our forensic interviewing team will interview those kids in age-appropriate and developmentally appropriate ways. Um, and if the child makes a disclosure, they are then referred to our therapy department. And so I see around 21 kids a week um, on my caseload, anywhere between ages 7 to 25. Um, all of them have experienced some sort of abuse, whether it is a one-time incident. Um, I have a few clients who experience sexual abuse at the hands of a caregiver for over 15 years or their entire life. And so really ranges um, in the types of trauma exposure that my kiddos have um, that provide different therapeutic modalities depending on what they need. So each day is a little bit different. It's kind of bouncing back and forth between different skill sets, um, especially working with teens and adults and then compared to little ones when we're doing more play therapy and interacting um, in just different ways that are more age appropriate for them. Um, and so the days are full. Every day is a little bit different. You never know what to expect. And um, especially with kids and teenagers who, right, all have different normal crises of the week that are happening too. And so it's not only focusing on the trauma work, but just getting to be a part of their lives as they're making that transition through childhood and adolescence too. Thank you, Ms. Olson. Um, our next question is for Ms. Bernadette Booker. Um, how, sorry, what are the advantages of having an, an accredited teacher education program and how will this assist teachers in the profession? Um, well, one of the advantages is that it provides a system of checks and balances. Um, if the accreditation program has tenets that align with growing your, your educators. Here's the thing about education. If it is a field you aspire to be in, then what you have to, um, resolve yourself to is the fact that you will never stop learning. And it's important that you do the work to make sure you are a lifelong educator. Because here's the thing, 
we asked the question of Officer Jones earlier about how they are aligning to social changes, but those social changes also bleed over into classrooms and educational systems. And if we don't have educators who have aligned themselves and um, decided that they want to make sure they do the work to change as society changes, then what happens is we create very traumatic experience and experiences and oftentimes for a very specific population of people, right? So what accrediting bodies do is they ensure that our districts, that our teachers are continuously and constantly growing as professionals and that's what we need. You cannot become stagnant in this profession. First of all, stagnation breeds boredom. And I think I have a touch of ADHD, so I can't be bored in anything I do. I need to change me myself. Um, but second of all, what stagnation does um, is it also, in some cases, breeds contempt, and not necessarily from the person that is stagnant, but the person that is experiencing the stagnation, right? And that's our students. So if we have accrediting bodies that ensure that there are certain tenets that education systems have to align themselves with, and that includes and means changing as society changes, right? Recognizing what our students are going through and to outside of the classroom because all that stuff presents itself inside of the classroom, right? Um, then we, we ensure we, include, we create an inclusive body that can service our students from what we like to call the top up because we don't just provide an education. It's social emotional learning that should go on in classrooms as well. And those things are important. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Booker. This next question is for Ms. Jones. How, how is your police department addressing the shortage across the nation in law enforcement officers? And also, um, what's been the difference between recruiting post pandemic and like now? Because of course things are different because demand. So if you could elaborate on that as well. So recruiting, the numbers are the numbers. Um, we always want to make sure that we're hiring enough people to keep the city safe. That's just a given. Um, I've been on this department for 16 years, and we've been hiring for 16 years. And the question I get is, are y'all hiring? Um, we're always hiring. Matter of fact, if you Google it, there's a video out there with Officer Jones saying, we're always hiring. Come on in. Because that's just what it is. You cannot, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, you're not going to change someone's mind that want to be a police officer. This is not a career that you just get up and say, Wah! go and put this bulletproof vest on and, uh, you know, and, and go in out here and be the police. It's a, it's a calling. And it's something that I don't care what anybody say if I, if I, I sit here wholeheartedly. If there was something that's going on right now, I'm running towards the issue. I want to make sure that everybody else is getting the safety. So um, nationwide, we are having a police shortage. Um, I, I guess that's what I'll use. Um, it's, it's this, I just feel like people have been a little bit deterred in wanting to pursue this career based on the negative rhetoric that follows it. You know, I say in every profession, there's always bad apples that make the, 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 the you know, job bad. Um, I, I, maybe people tell me that I live in a, in a bubble, but I don't have any of those police officers that are bad people. I don't associate with officers that are out here, you know, depriving people of their rights and infringing upon their rights. I don't, I, that's not my deal. I, I don't associate with that. And so, um, as far as hiring, we're going to hire pre pandemic, post pandemic. We never stopped. And yes, we are hiring. We're always hiring. <laughs> Um, and please feel free to go on our website. But there was an extension to that question as to, you know, what are we doing with because of the shortage? Um, we have another thing for changes. You know, we have different technology. You know, we use technology where um, we have a better camera systems. We have, you know, um, better radios where we can work with different agencies. We have um, just um, our body worn cameras, you know, just having having more opportunity to utilize technology, I feel like is how we can kind of accommodate some of that shortage. Bless you. Um, thank you again, Officer Jones. Um, our next question, again, will be for Ms. Bernadette Booker. Um, 
Why do you think most teachers are white females? And what could be done to diversify the profession? Ooh, yeah, that's such a heavy question, right? Um, it's lofty. So I'm going to say this, and I'm going to preface this with saying this is a, not an attack on anybody in this room because this is not systems that you have built. These are sim simply systems that we all operate within, right? Um, the majority of our teachers, about 80%, right, are white female because the system is a safe place for them. And it has been that way historically. Um, when we think about recruitment practices, hiring practices, there are implicit biases that are built into these practices. And here's the thing, whether, whether it's to anybody's fault or not, because ideally the very definition of implicit bias is automatic unintentional bias in the way you think, you act, and you behave. Right? And it means it's something you're not doing intentionally. It's something that's been ingrained in you. And when we look at the hiring practices of many of our districts, when we look at the recruitment and admissions practices of many of our ECPs or our early or our education certification programs, there are implicit biases built into those programs, whether it's on the side of admissions or whether it's on the side of recruitment. And it can look like any number of things. It can look like standardized test scores that put testing above teacher performance. Because here's the thing about standardized testing. And if you know anything about education, testing never stops. Whether you are in the system or work outside of the system in the form of like a classroom teacher, right? You never stop being tested. Um, but our teachers have to be tested also in order to get their certification. They have to be tested. And those tests are what determine whether or not they get certification, whether or not they get licensure. Well, we know just historically, people who look like me, have underperformed in standardized tests. And that's because even within those testing systems, those are, there are biases that are built into those testing systems in the way that they are administered and the way that people are tested. But those scores supersede a, supersedes a person's capacity for what they can do in the classroom. Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, as an educator and as a professional, you can score 100% on every certification test you take. But when you get into that classroom, it is a very different ball game, we are talking about theory versus practice. You are in the trenches for all intents and purposes. It's funny, South by Southwest is going on in Austin right now, and they had a TNTP, um, the New Teacher Project, had a panel yesterday. And um, on the panel, there was this young man named um, Sharif L. Makey, and he is with the Center for Black Educator Development. And he said two very, he, two very important things that kind of stuck with me and kind of hit me in the heart and made me sad a little bit. The first thing that he said was, um, and this was, this was not a direct quote from him, but a, a quote from his counterpart. He said, asking black, brown, and indigenous teachers to return to the profession as educators is like asking a victim to go back to the scene of a crime where they were victimized because their experiences going through, matriculating through education is very different and then oftentimes very traumatic. So I don't want to return to that. If I've been victimized in this space and in this place, why do I want to be there now as a victimizer, right? Because I'm operating within a system, right? And the other thing he said is that we have to change the ecosystem of how these people of color are educated, of how we address them, of how we treat them when they are going through these systems. Because the problem kind of like what Officer Jones spoke about earlier, is making sure that you can reach back and grab your own. That's the problem. But if you've gone up through a system that is truly traumatic and traumatizing to you and has always told you you are not good enough and this standardized test has told me that you are not worth it and you are not, and I have relegated you to this subset in this population, you're gonna see that, you're gonna think that system is not for you. So why then would I get myself up out of that system only to return to the system? I wouldn't do, that's crazy, right? That's crazy. You don't escape from an abuser only to return to the abuser to continue being abused, mm -hmm. right? And so we really have to align how we educate all students. I'm just not speaking about students of color. We really have to align with how we educate all students um, because we want people to get out of the system and then in turn want to come back. I'm a teacher now because of Miss Brenda Coleman, my fifth grade teacher. I will never forget this. She is the reason why I said, 
when I finally made it into the classroom, I was like, I want to be like her. I want to be like her, right? And a lot of our students who um, look like us, in most cases, who are not white students, in most cases, they don't have those experiences. In the nation, 40% of students, 40%, 40% of students in this nation have teachers who do not look like them in any way. 54% of students identify as non-white. 80% of our teachers are white. And that is not an attack on whiteness. <coughs> That's an attack on a system who has completely ignored others. So that's why it is. And it's unfortunate, but it's the truth. And when I'm asked about it, I speak on it if I can make it through it without crying. Right? <laughs> because it, it, it does. It saddens you. Right? It saddens you. You think that you have this impact on people and you want to have this impact and you, and you want to grow and foster and cultivate um, global citizens and global learners. But a lot of times they come out of our public education system and they don't want anything to do with it. And it's because of the experience. If it was pleasant, they run back. But they haven't experienced the pleasantry. So outside of implicit biases in recruitment and admission, there is also a personal need to not return to the scene of the crime, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Booker. So we have two questions for Dr. Olson. And the first one builds off of what Ms. Booker was actually saying. As in education, social work is very similar. The pioneers in social work are white women. And so one of the questions that we have for you, Dr. Olson, is do you believe diversity, equity, and inclusion is being successfully integrated in social work as a whole and also in your organization that you work with? Great question. Um, no, <laughs> I don't. Um, I think there is still a ton of work that needs to be done and progress that needs to be made. Does that mean that no progress has been made? No. Right? I think that social work as a whole is slowly moving the needle, but there is just so much more that needs to be done, especially regarding curriculum, right? And the curriculum that's created in schools of social work that are then preparing, right, or wanting to prepare diverse leaders who can go out and critically think and solve the social problems that we see in our world. And a lot of our schools of social work just aren't prepared to do that well or fail to really educate on the entire right history of different people and different experiences. And so I think that you know, a lot of schools of social work are moving more so towards reframing curriculum and having more of an anti-racist approach to the way that we're learning, the way that we're educating. But I can tell you that that is new since I've even been in graduate school, right? So I went straight through my BSW master's and PhD program and got to the end of all of those without any changes really having been completed or made. And so there are changes being done, um, but I think, like I said, there's just a lot more work that needs to happen. Specifically within our agency, I think we have been blessed with a CEO who really cares and prioritizes these initiatives. And so we had a couple of um, professors from UH, um, from the College of Social Work, that actually came out and did a bunch of trainings on cultural competence for us. And they broke it down by all of the different groups of kids that we serve in Fort Bend County um, and what those groups of people have experienced, not just in the past 10 years or five years, but in like the past 100 years in Fort Bend, like what has life looked like for this group of people? And then how are we going to best serve and meet their needs? And so I think we have been very lucky that that has been championed and not only with all of our providers and how we're providing our direct service and our training, but then also just culturally, right? Like what does our organizational culture look like? Um, and so we've been working with an outside consultant on issues of DEI and we have different champion journeys going on right now where we have different groups within our agency who are trying to champion different um, leadership opportunities, different opportunities for growth and training and community engagement. Um, and then we've kind of added a B to the end of DEI to include belonging as well. And so we write a book called Design for Belonging. And so really looking at organizationally, when we look at our culture and the design of our agency, how are we increasing belonging among us, right? So that we are a coherent um, and consistent group of people who internally and externally as well. Um, and so I would say those are kind of the main things. That we've Thank you. The next question is also for you. 
How do the NASW comp competencies intersect with the work you do? Yeah. So I think all of them do, right, in a million different ways. I think they shape the way that we think, right, and that we're interacting with clients. For me specifically, being a clinician, right, I am constantly assessing, intervening, and evaluating all of my clients, right, and with their families as well. But when I think of this question, I more so think about the, you know, engaging in research-informed practice and practice-informed research. And that is why getting my PhD was so important to me, right? There is so much research that is done that lives in academic journals, right, that only very privileged few people have access to, to be able to read that work and to be able to do anything with it. And when I went in, I said, you know, I don't want to get my PhD and just be another person where four other, maybe four other people in the world who carry, care about the very narrow niche interest of mine, read it and go, that's great. Now I'll go, you know, research this a little bit further, right? I want my work to actually touch the kids that I want to serve and to touch the community. And so part of doing that then is being in the community, right? Getting the practice experience to be able to say, like, this is what my kids are needing. Right, this is what I'm seeing in practice, and this is research I can do that will hopefully change policy and then change the way that clinicians work and operate, right? Change the interventions that we use so that we're best needing the needs of our community, right? And especially kids who have experienced such extensive trauma um, and aren't necessarily being reached in the best way because research hasn't gotten there yet. Um, and so I think that's probably the, the competency I think of the most. Thank you. So uh, my, next, my next question is uh, for Officer Jones. Uh, as we know, police officers are pretty much uh, tasked to enforce law, right? But what else do police officers do to kind of help the community and, and, and uh, help bring services? So community engagement is very, very, very important um, to us as a police department. You know, we have most people don't realize this is a pretty, we're the fourth largest um, police department. Is that correct? Um, but a lot of our work is a very minimal portion of patrol. Um, a lot of what we do is community and helping people understand what um, the police, what we do. And it's a lot of um, youth programs. We have a plethora of youth programs that help police engage with youth so that we don't see the youth on the other side of having to make arrests and what have you. And we do this from a very, very um, young age. You know, we're inside of a lot of schools, you know, talking to kids about gang prevention. We have a gang prevention unit. Uh, we have Boys and Girls Club. I'm a mentor at the Boys and Girls Club where we try to make sure that we keep these kids very connected to us so that they can get used to and kind of, they call it humanizing the badge, okay? And, and that way, we don't have you running from us as adults and, and teenagers, you know, you understand like, oh, that's Officer Jones or that's Officer Gonzalez. So they're, you know, they're, they're just the police. We're just the police trying to get them to see that. So we have many, many youth programs. Uh, we have a, a program for high schoolers, it's uh, TAPS, and it's, um, the acronym stands for Teen and Police Services Academy, where um, we go in and, and basically teach kids about relationships with you know, their parents, with the teachers, with, with police, and how to um, adapt in society, because they're some of the kids that are kind of at risk. So we have some of our uh, men and women that go to the schools every day. I think they're teachers. I, I, commend them on what they do because that's not something that I would want to do is go into the schools every day working with kids but it's very important because we have to build those relationships I feel like my total job is community um, so we do I work in community affairs every weekend every evening there's events like this um, where we have community engagement uh, right now as we speak we have a youth program uh, with our with our YPAC our youth police advisory council where this is a group of teenagers that are with uh, the chief of police and right now they're with also with the mayor where we uh, have those conversations we listen to these youth about what they see um, from the police 
and what they ex what they expect from the police and kind of um, how we can best serve them and their needs. We have senior events. Uh, I just did a Valentine's dance here on February 14th, and this senior, she was literally, I think she was 100 plus, and she was dropping in like it's hot. So we do <laughs> lots of lots of dancing. Um, you know, just lots of being involved. We want to make sure that we can get close to you so that we can kind of humanize this this position of that we're in. Uh, we understand that we're police officers. And the most uncomfortable thing and that I don't think I'll ever get used to is walking in a room and people just, you know, ever since kind of like George Floyd and other things that's happened. I mean, we can go way back. Um, it's an uncomfortable feeling because I am that officer along with a ton of other officers that are going to help you when you need help. And so to know that and people kind of cringe when you see an officer come in the room or when you're, you know, in the presence, it's so uncomfortable because I feel like we still have, well, we always have work to do, but we have to continue to build those relationships with the community. Um, so we are, once again, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you want to come hang out with the police, <laughs> this is all we do. We do community engagement. They didn't hire, they didn't, we have a whole division for community, so uh, we have lots of programs, and please feel free to look at them on our page. So we are getting to the conclusion of our panel discussion, but I do want to thank all of our panelists. Can we give just one more round of applause for the amazing panelists today? Um, but I do want to pose one question, one last question for you guys. Um, our question, and we can start with Ms. Olson and just go down. Um, our last question will be, if there is one thing you would like um, this audience to take away from the session, um, what would it be? Um, I think as I was thinking about this question, one of the quotes that came to me is, the work is plenty, but the laborers are few, right? There is so much work to be done with mental health with education and within criminal just justice, right? And you guys have a unique opportunity to join us in that mission. And I think having, you know, not being afraid to initiate the conversations with the people that are in the field where you want to be, right? Have those conversations, be courageous, right? And have a greater purpose for what you're doing, right? If you feel like you're on mission, like she said, every day you're showing up and it's not a job, right? Like you're following a greater sense of purpose for your life and it's impacting other lives as well. Um, and so that's what I will leave you with. Um, we need you and we, we want you to be, to be here with us and joining us in this work. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there was one thing that I could leave with you guys, it would be to ask the hard question mm -hmm. and do the hard work, right? If you are uncomfortable moving through, and I was having this conversation earlier, if you are uncomfortable moving through something through an experience, um, uh, through an opportunity, you are probably doing what is right. And doing the right thing is not always comfortable, mm -hmm. right? Um, but be purpose driven at all times. Um, a lot of times we want to get into careers for any number of reasons, right? Because they pay us well. Well, that's what most people wanna do. Get into careers because they pay us well, you know, but make sure you're being fulfilled mm -hmm. and what you do and the money will come. Right? There are so many other avenues outside of just your nine to five job where when you build yourself and you fortify yourself and you build your own capacity, you can leverage those things outside of just what is paid to you or what is owed to you. Be purpose driven. Make sure you're being fulfilled in what you do because that matters. You don't want to show up every day presenting an empty vessel to a place or to a thing. Right. So that's it for me. There was one thing that you can take away from the Houston Police Department is just um, we want to be held accountable. I don't, I don't think anybody wears this badge or, and uh, this uniform and, and we think that we are above what um, good is. So hold us accountable. Uh, I challenge you to talk to police officers. They, they're they're going to be more than happy to talk to you. Ask questions. There's so many levels to um, to this career. It's a great career. I mean, if you have the heart of service, please, you know, look into it. And if you don't have the heart of service, please stay away from it. Okay. <laughs> because um, it's, it's just real. Yeah. So, so um, help us humanize our badge because HPD and all of our surrounding agencies really do care. We don't always get it right, but um, help us be the best that we can be because we truly do want to serve. 
Thank you all so much for answering those questions. But we do have some questions from from uh, our audience and also uh, a couple of questions from our audience on Zoom. So um, I'm going to start with uh, Officer Jones. Uh, we're going to start with you. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, a really important question. Uh, so that's why we're going to uh, do it right now. So it says, uh, how do you or your department work to eliminate and educate your staff on personal bias so that it does not uh, affect the population you are serving? Training, training and training. You know, when you do, when you know better, you do better. And we've had this, um, you know, after the George Floyd incident and other things that are happening, you have to pay attention to what's happening. If you, if we put our heads in the sand and we're not serving, we're not giving any justice to the community. So um, we put on a really great training um, in, in regards to building trust from trauma. And just the words of that kind of speaks volumes and how important um, and how much the department, we don't want to go backwards. Um, a portion of that building trust from trauma talks about all those things. And, and helping, I'm a 16 year officer, but helping officers that have just come on that don't know anything about Moody Park riots, don't know anything about the TSU riots, um, don't know any of our history of things that have happened in the past that we don't want to repeat. So we do lots of training uh, for our police cadets. Um, we make sure that we take them around all of our marginalized communities. So before you get this badge, you're going to go out into the community. Um, we, you can call it a field trip. It's a multicultural bus tour. We take you out into the different communities and we want you to hear from our community leaders. We want you to hear their concerns and how they feel when it comes to, you know, policing in their areas, you know, so um, just training. I think training is very significant in regards to, you know, being inclusive and things of that nature. Thank you. Thank you. And I have another, I have a follow up question for, for you regarding uh, all, um, where you talked about how we get involved with the community. So they want to know how are they get involved with uh, those programs that you mentioned to, uh, and then to start a conversation or, or have a conversation with the community. Okay. We have something called PIP. It's called Positive um, Interaction Programs, PIP. Positive interaction program. These things are held most likely every three months or so, um, where we just have different locations. And like, and I hate to keep referencing this, but it's really true. The website, we want the community to know what we're doing. So our PIP meetings are very important because it's an opportunity for you to go into an area in your community and be able to ask the police questions. That's, that's really important. I just recently bought a house and um, we have HOA meetings, and I think to myself, oh, I probably should go in to these HOA meetings so I could be aware of what's going on in my community. So, but the PIP meetings are important because that's one way that you can be engaged with what's going on. And you can ask those questions about something that you feel is a problem in your community or something that you feel is being um, unaddressed. We also have um, our police academy. We have our citizens police academy if you want to get involved. That's a great way to get involved because knowledge is power. And when you see kind of some of the things, a glimpse of it, we're going to put you through an eight-week training. Um, it's every Thursday at, I think they start at maybe 7 o'clock or something. Don't hold me to that time. But it's at our police academy. We're going to teach you different driving, shooting techniques of what the Houston police do when we're out here on the streets. And so that's a, uh, you can become a, a citizen police, basically helping us spread the word um, about what's going on in the community and how people can um, be engaged. If you are interested in joining any of these programs, if you have a youth that you feel, you know, needs a little extra attention from an officer, or, or please feel free. We, um, Office of Community Affairs is actually on the website, HPD Community Affairs. You can email us. Also, um, or you can call us, 713-308-3200. That's 713-308-3200. Um, you can call and ask any questions that you have in per pertaining to the community. We do program requests also. So if you want your youngins or your teenagers to have an opportunity to, you know, talk to the police or see some of our um, mounted patrol, K-9, you know, you might have a, or your church or your, your child care facility, they want police interaction. Those are things that we do too. Most people do not know that. You just have to go online and fill out this form and say, I want the police here at this time in this location. And we show up, show out, bring the stickers for the little babies or whatever have you. And that's another portion of our community police engagement. 
Did I answer your question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I want to piggyback on, on, on one of her points that she made about the Citizens Police Academy, which is a great program. Uh, I was involved on it for a little while. Then I started my grad, uh, my grad program, and I kind of had to stop. But it's, uh, it, we had two classes, and it's one at, um, on fall and another one in spring. With the spring, I already started, so it's too late. But for the fall one, um, registration starts in uh, June. Okay, and then it, the class starts in September, and it's a 10-week, a ten uh, and it's uh, on Tuesdays or Thursdays. So they, they change the date, uh, the days that you attend, uh, but it's from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., and you go through a lot of uh, the good training. So it, I really highly recommend it. So please um, uh, go to your Nextdoor app. Uh, a lot of information is on your Nextdoor app. for, uh, And then the PIP meetings, if you go to the PIP meetings, uh, you'll find that information in there. It's a great, great program. If you really want to know what police officers do, that's like the best thing that you can do. And, and I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> um, so we are, we just have two more questions, guys. Two more questions from the audience. Um, this question will be directed to Ms. Olson. Um, what part of your social work studies did you find most challenging? Hmm, that is a great question. I mean, I think the initial answer, which is not the answer that I think this person was looking for, was the statistics courses um, in my PhD program <laughs> um, and all of the research knowledge. I honestly think that you just learn so much within our social work programs that it can be hard to narrow down those skills and techniques when you're actually in the field and practicing. You learn this wealth of information that kind of applies to any like generalist area, but being able to take that and then say, okay, these are the skills and techniques I'm gonna need to best serve this population with this need is a little bit harder. And so I wouldn't say that it was necessarily a challenge and um, anything you know regarding the education or curriculum, but more so once you're applying that in real life, how that translation works. And you know our placements and um, time in different agencies in the community is great, right? And it provides that initial kind of foundational work. But then when you're first hired and you're like, oh my gosh, like I took this clinical course three years ago and now I'm providing therapy, like what do I do? How do I do it? You know, so I think that translation piece was probably the most challenging. Thank you. And our last question will be for Ms. Booker. Um, just to give a side note, just give Ms. Booker her flowers. Um, when I started the education journey of becoming a teacher, she was one of the first teachers I met right out of high school when I decided I wanted to be a teacher. At that time, I was like, yeah, nah. But um, I think she she's really the first person that um, made me decide I want to be a teacher and I want to be just like her and teach the way that she does and care the way she does. So I really want to just um, acknowledge her. <laughs> I am a baby. But, um, of course. But um, the question is, as a mom with kids with autism, mm -hmm. my major concern is inclusion. Um, what do you think needs to change so kids with any type of disability, um, sorry, it's kind of, need to receive good education? Yeah. Legislation. Um, I am I'm going to kick it back to those who make the decisions as it relates to our babies um, that have special needs. Um, in the state of Texas, we do a phenomenal job and in, in surrounding districts especially, um, identifying our kids with special needs and placing them in programs that align with those needs and making sure that they need, their needs are being met, but that is not the case everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, so I often tell parents, um, the people with the most power, this is a little well-kept secret, y'all. The people with the most power are the parents. They have the power to shift, to change, to move literal mountains. They are the ones that have the voices that can amplify them so that they are heard. So whenever you come against um, what would be seen as pushback or whenever you come against what would be seen as a hurdle, amplify your voice. If you cannot get satisfactory level, um, satisfactory responses at the school level, go to the district. If you cannot get it at the district level, go to your local politicians. If you cannot get it at the local level, go to the state level. 
because they listen to parents, right? Um, luckily, we have all different types of systems in place and laws in place that align with our babies with special needs. But what we do know is that oftentimes the ball is dropped, right? And when we know better, we do better. Um, Officer Jones made a point early, and I'm going to paraphrase what she said, um, but basically we want to do the good work, right? But sometimes we, we misstep. We misstep. And that's where advocacy for your baby comes in. And making sure you don't, you are not quiet until you are heard. Thank you, Ms. Booker. <clears throat> so we are going to go ahead and wrap up our session. Um, just one more round of applause for our amazing panelists. I hope that everyone leaves here, leaves the session empowered and ready to make a difference. And just like our panelists named, ready to build a movement. Um, thank you so much, audience. Thank you so much, um, everyone on the Zoom, for attending. Um, you guys have a great night. Of course. <laughs>